Um, and okay, you're playing you're playing a stronger player. Twenty two. Is he like an older guy? Is he a twenty two hundred floor? Yeah, he's an older gentleman. Gotcha. Sometimes those are the best types of players to scrape off rating against because they're they're overrated. Like they can't go below their floor. Oh um, really? <laughs> so sometimes, like even if it says twenty two hundred, they're not actual like master strength. Hmm. Uh, but okay, he played quite well. I mean, he played well enough in this game that he knew what he was doing in the opening and then just capitalized on your, your blunder. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if we talk about the opening, um, it seemed like he was quite well prepared. Mm -hmm. Like, 96 is not the type of move you come up with just over the board. Mm -hmm. um, you played one of the main lines, uh, bishop to b5. I will say in the future that if you're playing like a much stronger player, um, I saw you do this in another game. Like you played G3 rather than F4. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have another recommendation here, which I kind of discovered after playing this opening for some time, that um, if I feel like my opponent will be prepared for F4, I would usually be inclined to play this move Knight G2. Mm -hmm. where it's a very flexible move. Um, many times you just go for kind of a close Sicilian. Mm -hmm. Later you play f4, and um, it would be similar to playing g3 on, uh, on the third move. Mm -hmm. uh, the one advantage knight ge2 has over g3 is that if black plays d5, you're, uh, you're very well ready to capture on d5 and play immediately d4. Hmm which will usually result in some position where black has my side a d-pawn. Got it. So it's a nice way to, I guess, try and discourage black from playing d5 immediately, and then just oh. get kind of a, a comfortable setup for white. I see. Because black wants to play d5 when you play f4. f4 kind of, yeah. It yeah. kind of encourages d5 just because... Um, like black wants to challenge his center given you've you've overextended a little bit. Um and of course, okay, there's there's many ways the line can branch out and there's many good possibilities for white from, from this opening, but um I mean based on my experience, if, if black is well prepared, it can be hard to find a, an early advantage for white. Got it. Okay, cool. Good. Good to know. So so yeah, I mean and if you play knight G two, um I think the main move I've I've run into in the past is knight c6, mm -hmm. and I, I like this is still in my repertoire nowadays. Like if I know my opponent plays Sicilian and they play e6 on move two, I'm usually intrigued or, or at least interested in going into this line because I stay very flexible. I'm, I'm also allowing myself the possibility of playing d4 if I feel like I could be tricking them into some open Sicilian that they're not familiar with. Mm. So it's it's one of those things like okay you, you you're probably not the type of player who would play d4 immediately but um, sometimes you can do specific preparation for specific players. Got it. Very cool. But when you play after knight c6, do you do do you then reveal okay I'm playing g3? Or I would you... usually start yeah. So like I, I would only play d4 if I'm comfortable with like going into time on with Sicilian. Mm -hmm. um, but I would usually play g3 like bishop g2 and castling and then decide. Like based on black setup, if I want to play d3 or d4. Hmm. So you do play d4, or you like you could play d4 later on. Exactly. Yeah. And, and there are certain like types of open Sicilians where when you play d4 and you're you're being kettled with bishop g2 and, and g3, it can be a uh, very rich position with many ideas for white. Oh, I, I don't think I've ever seen games like that where there's a open Sicilian and a bishop on g2. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Like if we. The, the way to find games is just let's play it out. Like, let's just play the main line. Let's say, um, okay, let's say some bishop e7 move, castling, castling, and then let's say d4. And whenever you play d4, a black is pretty much obliged to capture, take back with knight. And this would kind of be the main starting position where you'd want to yeah. you know, look through some games. And as far as I understand, like at the master level, white has pretty good results. Um, I think it's the type of position 
like the, the computer will usually prefer for white too. Like sometimes the computer will find some interesting ideas. Mm -hmm. um, from my experience, like there's sometimes early like G4, G5 ideas. Um, sometimes it's more positional, like bishop e3 and knight b3, and then uh, like some a4 move to stop blacks, like a6, b5 ideas. So it's mm -hmm. a playable position for sure. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. It might be a good surprise weapon because I don't think many Sicilian players are prepared against an open Sicilian with the bishop g2 or, you know, fiancato. Exactly. And, like, to, um, to reiterate or to maybe clarify, um, there's a lot of players who will play e6 on move 2 against knight c3, but they'll play some completely different move, like knight or for... Um, or some different variation against knight f3. So mm. sometimes you can trick them by starting with knight c3, uh, kind of provoking them to play a move they don't usually play against knight f3, and then basically turn it into an open Sicilian later on in the game. Yeah, and they're not used to playing e6. They might be used to playing d6 and the dragon or something. Yeah. And I, I would be curious, like, uh, if you play this guy again, if, if you can maybe find games that he's been, he's played in the past and see what variation of uh, of Sicilian he plays, mm -hmm. maybe prepare specifically. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, I actually see he has, he's had one game against uh, Nikola Mikoff, who's like one of the most renowned uh, Knight C3 Sicilian players. Mm. Um, I'm going to try and find uh, a link to the game. Yeah, send me that link. And he's he's like renowned, like as in Guy One Jones level. Like, um, he's probably in top five. Like Gawain Jones is probably around number one. Mikov <laughs> is, is like top five among grandmasters who will consistently play Knight C three. Oh, awesome! I will see his games too. Yeah. Actually, I him. Like, the most trip. recent tournament I played him, I was lost after twelve moves. And he also tricked me. Like it was, <laughs> it was so unfortunate. Um, he actually he tricked me into some open Sicilian variation I hadn't seen before, and then I I didn't know the theory. I'll try and find that game. I don't know if <laughs> okay, I sure. It. Uh, but I just brought in the uh, the Mikhail yeah. Galagos game, where uh, like he plays knight f three on on move three, and then just goes right into open Sicilian. And um, it can be very dangerous if you know ideas in both closed Sicilian and open Sicilian, because then you can kind of pick and choose what to play against certain opponents. Mm. Uh, but maybe th this is something to play around with, like more long term, like as, as you you grow as a chess player. Yeah, like, it can be effective in, in getting even strong players out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Nice, a lot of psychology involved here. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and it's. This is one of my like most favorite like kind of move order tricks in any opening is to like play knight c3 then like knight g2 or knight f3 and then d4. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, we can focus on what happened in the game because it wasn't I mean, wasn't over so soon. Uh, even though it was, it was over pretty soon. Um, <laughs> a wonder. So okay, this should be five. Very fine move. Um, if you were to get this again, g3 is also quite playable. Yeah. Where sometimes the bishop is happy on g2. Mm -hmm. When you play bishop e5, sometimes you're you're committing to trade it off right away. Yeah, I had that a lot when they just play bishop d7 and they don't ruin the pawn structure. Um, but when I play in this position, when you play g3 and bishop g2, is it detrimental that your knight is blocking you? And, when it should be on e2 instead of f3? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, or is it fine? Like, yeah. It's... I mean, the knight is well placed, like within the pawn structure. And normally, the, like, the bishop, naturally, bishops don't become active until later, like when the position opens up. So g2 is like one of the best squares on the board for the bishop, where it's not in the way of anything, it's not like a target that black can attack. Mm -hmm. It's a good defender, and it will come to life like after things get traded. Also, like in many cases, you'll have knight e5, which naturally unleashes the bishop. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and usually in these types of positions, you look to play bishop g2, you castle, and then you play G B b3 and bishop b2. And mm -hmm. the bishops actually coordinate quite well. They, um, they have influence over all the center squares. Yeah. Got it. So I think, um, did, did you ever get the, the book by Gawain Jones? Yeah, yeah, I have it. Because I think he might mention this. I, I'm sure he mentions this, this sort of line. I forget if he recommends g3 or bishop b5. I forget this exact line, but I remember one game he showed, like, it's common to double fee and cattle your bishops. Right. Yeah, I have some vague memory of, like, looking looking over these lines when I was uh, when I was playing this consistently myself. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. I remember, like, being impressed with whatever game he showed in, in one of these lines. Mm. So it's something to look into. I think I I think I was actually impressed with b3 bishop b2 because when I first started playing this I was playing like d3 and bishop d2 and I was like I was in awe that the bishop could just develop <laughs> to such a good square. Yeah. Nice. And, and did I ever show you um, the line with knight f6 because this is another move to be prepared for? I don't think you showed me this. No. Um, I'll I'll show it to you. I'm pretty sure I did. Maybe there's like video evidence somewhere in the. Oh, uh, maybe the you're right. <laughs> Uh, just to um, to show possibly again, uh, you can take on f6 and then play g3. Um, and you're, you're just going for natural development. I had this once in the game where my, my opponent played a very natural looking move, b6, uh, intending to try and neutralize uh, the long diagonal. Uh, turns out b6 was actually a, a very significant error. And now it's white to move and um, essentially get a, a really nice position. There's a very strong move here for white. Some other uh, multi-purpose move. Um, I'm not sure. I'll give you a clue. There's two vulnerable diagonals for black. Uh, the diagonal to the king is very vulnerable, mm -hmm. as well as the diagonal for the rook, or to the rook. Yes. Um, so the move it actually it creates threats along both diagonals. Interesting. I'm trying to move my knight so I can, my, my, my queen can get to f3. Mm -hmm. Um. I also don't don't see anything after bishop b5 check. Yeah, bishop b5 check immediately doesn't do too much. So what move so, can you play to make bishop b5 check a bit stronger? So knight e5, bishop b7, bishop b5? Yeah. Got Black it. Loses casting rights. Knight e5. Yeah. It's a type of move you might consider but not realize how strong it is. Yeah, the fact yeah. That you're threatening both queen b3 or queen f3 and bishop to b5. It's it's quite devastating. Mm -hmm. Got um, it. I got to see two moves ahead in that one. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And I'm actually excited. I, I I have the database open. Gawain Jones had this in uh, its only game. If you check in the Masters database. Oh I'm yeah. Start the game. Um, seems like nice. something to at least be knowledgeable about. It's a6 was was played and the rook has to go to a7 and then knight e5 also allows white to play b3 and bishop b2 and now the queen's a target mm -hmm. so black wastes so much time just playing these ridiculous moves like rook a7 and queen d8 and meanwhile white is just developing very naturally yeah and it's an open position too so yeah i'd be interested if this game is in his book but maybe the book was published before 2007. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, sure. It's curious. Okay, so white was doing quite well. Maybe black somehow neutralized, but yeah, white eventually transforms advantage. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's uh, let's go back. Let's see what happened in your game because sure. you want to save time for the other games as well. Sure, sure. Um, so 96 is played. Um, 
I made I actually made a comment here that I I had this position once against uh, a, a master from Washington. It was in the the U.S. Chess League. It was like an online league. Mm. And I found the game. It's in like a very old U.S. Chess article. Nice. So I'll read it. Afterwards, if you're curious, I mean yeah. the, the game isn't too relevant. I I did end up winning the game as white. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I actually played I played the double fiend keto, but mm. my opponent still use this knight h6 knight f5 idea okay um but somehow i was able to uh still get a dynamic position and eventually play for a win like eventually um i, I attacked on the king side with the bishop glaring down at, at, uh, at g7 mm. um from this position let's go forward because i think a d3 is fine knight f5 and i think this was a moment that even if you like weren't that well prepared in the opening. The, the next move should not have been played. Really, should take d6. Because mm. uh, I, I think it, it's only helping black. At the very least, you should wait for black to play a6 before you you take on c6. Yeah. So let like wait, let him waste tempo first. Because I thought he was just gonna play it anyway. So mm-hmm. I would just get it out of the way now and then continue. I, oh, actually, no. Sorry, I thought he was gonna put two knights on d4. That's why. Mm. Yeah. So I was going to say, there's more useful things to do in the position. Um, I think the the move to play here, maybe you, you were not so encouraged to play it because I mean, when you look at this position, you want you definitely want to put your bishop on b2. Yeah. But against this specific idea, I think c3 is the way to go. Hmm. Even though, okay, your bishop no longer <laughs> wants to go to b2 after c3, yeah. you're restricting the knight. And in many cases, uh, at least in some cases, you would like to play g4 and question the stability of the knights. Um, and meanwhile, your your bishop will maybe stay put until the knight is removed from f5, and then maybe you'll do something like this. Interesting. Okay. Also, you can preserve your bishop when you play c3. Um, actually, I don't know if it's the best approach, but like after a6, you can consider playing bishop a4 to c2. c2, yeah. Which looks a bit strange, like black would probably gain space, uh, like bishop a4, b5, bishop c2. Um, but you're just saving your bishop for later. Like, mm-hmm. Eventually, the center should open up. Um, and you do have like some, some nice space in the position, given that you have... Um, you have your pawn on f4 controlling e5. You're ready to maybe play g4. Um, you still have these like queen e1 to swing over to the the king side ideas. So it would still be quite playable. Got it. And I saw you also made a note to g- to play g4 to or to consider play g4 immediately. Ah, uh, yeah. So th- this is another option. Um, like if you wanted to have like deep preparation for next time. Um, this looks really intriguing, or you're it, like it's a very concrete line. Or black, okay, pretty much obligated to play knight d4. Uh, you can take, can take on d7. You can play c3, kick the knight back. And the point of doing this is that black is a little bit underdeveloped, king still in the center, mm-hmm. and you can try and strike right away with f5. I was looking at this earlier. It's a very double-edged position. The engine will say like approximately equal, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's like very drawish. This means okay, some maybe chances for both sides. Mm-hmm. And here, one of the points is okay. You have ideas of f six. Yeah. So you have to be careful. Um, yeah, black has to be careful taking on f5. Because that, like, that's opening up the center. Your rook can come into f5, c5 is attacked. Um, king is a target on e8. Mm-hmm. If the king castles queen side, there might be like bishop f4 move type ideas where the king ends up being stuck. Mm. So it, it's an interesting position. It's the type of move maybe um, you'd play if you're feeling very aggressive or <laughs> and you want to just keep the initiative in the position. Okay, good. Good to know. 
Yeah, so, I'll keep this in mind if I play the bishop b5 line. But the g3 line looks more appealing than when, when, we talked, when you talked about it earlier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess the reason why I'm showing you multiple lines is just to give yeah. you choices. Like, yeah, be thank more you. Comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would probably, like, my, my personal preference is just to play g3. Just be yeah. a bit more solid. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, if we go forward to what happened in the game, I think the at least the psychological problem, you were so fixated on what you wanted to do, you forgot about your opponent's mm -hmm. tactical ideas. Yeah. Which was a bit unfortunate, because the position is, is clearly still playable. Queen e2. I saw some of the lines you gave, and I think black is maybe slightly for choice, but um, especially if you can get your bishop to b2, it would be... Uh, it would be a fight. Mm -hmm. So, what was the time control? Like, were you? Was it rapid or? Uh, this one was fifty-five minutes. So that's not much. Yeah, it's a little bit slower. Day two was two hours. So day one's yeah. kind of like the the faster time controls. Yeah, it was fifty-five minutes. Um, I mean, blunders will happen more often just because. There's less time, and sometimes it's just about blunder checking and ensuring that you're you're playing slowly enough to avoid these careless blunders. Yeah, um, but quickly enough to to stay out of time trouble. Um. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of advice to give you for next time. <laughs> to, like no, not it's, not. It's the, it was just a careless mistake. I think. Uh... Um, I was just so thrown off by knight h6. I was like, "What? What is happening?" That I completely missed that he had the knight on e3 to be an option. I just never considered that he would do it. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. That when your opponent plays like some unusual idea, you have to be extra careful, like extra aware of the like different types of like tactical ideas that can emerge from from where their pieces are placed. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because if you're so used to the knight being on f6, like, um, when the knight's on f5, you don't maybe realize that like, there's additional squares the knight can move to. This has happened to me a lot um, in other positions where like I've played h3 and then I can like, hop into g3 from f5. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's a good point like in the opening just to be extra careful. Like When your opponent plays a new move, like, they just kind of take a step back just to, to realize their ideas. Mm, got it. Um, but okay, hopefully a, a game to learn from, even though it was a short game. I think there were still a, a good number of lessons to, to take away. Mm -hmm. So do you want to move on to uh, the the next game? Yeah, def oh, actually, in this game, can, we, can I take a look at a position uh, with you? Yeah, sure. I can uh, scroll it. Yeah, Here. go for it. Um, admit, I didn't look too much deeper after you lost the exchange. Yeah, that's Maybe totally fine. But... That's totally fine. Um, I've computer actually thought it was equal here. Mm. Oh, wow. Or like negative zero point two, or something. Like it was. It was. Oh, actually, sorry. Um, Well, right. I will say you did a good job of like keeping the files closed. <laughs> I had to, um, which is which is a great strategy when you're down the exchange. The rooks can't really come into play. Like, you have d3 defended, like that's your main kind of backward pawn. Yeah, black um, is so bad. Yeah, yeah. I, in this position, like computing is is pretty equal, and I was very surprised because in the game I was like. I have to checkmate black or else mm. he's going to like just, you know, open things up and then tear me down. Um, that might have been the, the wrong approach. Yeah. Not because you misevaluated. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you did slightly misevaluate. Um, sometimes when you're down material, there's two different types of strategies. Mm -hmm. One strategy is to do what you said like go for the kill try and like check your opponent to make things really crazy um in this specific position i think the other strategy would apply where you just you just want to hold on just wait and see what black is up to because it's not mm. clear how black is 
going to make sufficient progress. And sometimes you can even get a situation where black could over push. Black tries yeah. to open things up. Um, some move like G6 or something because he's getting impatient then, and that can be very bad for uh, for black. Now, I, I do see there is like one main idea for black is to play this A5, A4 push. Yeah, yeah, which he eventually did. Um, and I, I, I thought about that as well. Like, if, if I could just hold this position, like, it could, you know, maybe draw. But I, I thought realistically, like, you know, is it, is it possible? Can I just sit around all day and then black and just like combat whatever black's gonna do? Because eventually black will break through. That was my thought process, which is why mm -hmm. I wanted to attack. But I guess what you're trying to say is like maybe you could. There is a way to hold on. And well, we'll we'll have to take a look at the specific moves. Um, I will say. Um, I, I have the engine turned on now just to kind of get a sense of what what it might be oh, evaluating. Sure. sure. Um, like sometimes the, the engine will change its mind. Like it will say like minus 0.2 here. And mm -hmm. after playing G4, now it says minus 0.6. Yeah. At least for my uh, whatever depth it's, it's going at. Um, so, okay, black is still probably clearly better. And like sometimes with these types of positions, the computer might misevaluate if there's no immediate tactics. Mm -hmm. It's just relying on some positional evaluation. Um, let's go forward here, because I'm trying to understand what it's saying. And sometimes you have to, like, if you're analyzing with the engine, you have to kind of play it out to see what strategy the engine wants to employ. Like here, it likes queen h4. Then I would be curious, like, what happens after a5? It's saying to infiltrate with the queen. <laughs> I have ideas of queen g6 hmm. for a4. Queen. And sometimes it will just come up with some like crazy idea that you would never consider. <laughs> um, I'm thinking like, try and, like understand it. Yeah. Um, it, like, it does actually have a crazy idea here to, to play bishop c1 and then sacrifice on h6. And then somehow get repetition. <laughs> and it's giving a takes b3 and bishop takes h6. What? <laughs> g takes h6. Okay, so not queen a6 check, but you just take back your threatening maiden one. Only one move for black to stay alive. And then somehow you have nothing better than just repetition because you're down the whole rook. Oh my gosh, it's giving knight g5 check. But knight g5, it's just still the same repetition. <laughs> you could just repeat right away. <laughs> it's even oh, wow. giving knight g5 in this position is just a draw. Um, that's pretty nuts. I would have never seen that. But that's a cool idea. Yeah. So actually, um, like what I said earlier, may have been kind of contradictory to what the computer is actually recommending. It's recommending to go crazy and then I guess it's <laughs> a forcing repetition. Um, and sometimes the the way to understand these things is, is just by experience. Of course, like playing yeah. this out with engine kind of now makes you realize, like, oh wow, you have you have like all your pieces, like even your bishop helping play a role with so much firepower. Maybe there would be something like even even when you're down material, there is sometimes a possibility of sacrificing if you have enough firepower. Yeah, four strong here. Who who would have thought that? Yeah, now I'm curious what happens after a pawn takes a2, because black is ready to make a queen. <laughs> and there's no way to stop it. I don't have the engine turned on anymore. The engine was saying draw. <laughs> Ooh, I think I see the move. I think there's only one move. Knight takes there's a few moves. Check? No. And bishop takes f6. Yeah. Um... It looks like you allow him to get a queen. And you just take on g7? Yeah, that's what it looks like. And the king runs away to like... h4? I don't know. Just... I was thinking maybe you could like put the king on g2, play knight f2. Oh, I see. Like survive somehow that way. 
Um, I think there's an even simpler move here. Now, okay, now I'm trying to calculate. Oh, it's probably still drawn. There, there's kind of a nice, okay, so-called invisible move. Mm -hmm. um, I'll show you, because I, I don't know if it's right. I don't, I'll check with the engine afterwards, but I think it's bishop c1, where you're blocking the oh. check and you're threatening main in one. Oh. That's I nice. assume this is a draw after rook f8. Let's see. Oh no, why does winning? What? What? Ah, because there's there's queen h7 check. So after rook f8, queen h7, queen g6, king g8. And then rook h7? Rook h7, yeah. Rook f7? Rook f7. Queen h5? Uh, queen h5, yeah. Let's <laughs> mate. Let's see. That would be amazing if you won this game like this. Oh my goodness. I would, I would like jump up and down or something. I, I, that would be crazy. And if uh, if bishop d6 after this. Oh, still queen h5. The same thing. Yeah, because g6 is just rook h8, queen h7. Dang, nice. Okay. So, lots of lessons here. You could, like, maybe it might be your imagination to force a draw. That could be really cool. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 take, it takes a lot of imagination for uh, this type of play. Like, just to allow <laughs> black to, like, push the a-pawn all the way down. It's just... A little too slow for black. Interesting. Okay, nice. Rates. Nice. I'm ready to, to do the next game if yeah, if, yeah, let's move on. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> next one was against oh that was the next one was against Manas. Do you know uh, Manas? Uh I don't know him personally, no. Do okay. you? Um I kinda I know him virtually. So he's he's a streamer. He has a Twitch channel. Mm-hmm. He works and at he Twitch. Works, yeah. And he works at Twitch too. Yeah. So we've we've played a few games on the chess and I I've played close to ceiling against him. I'll have to um I think the very first time I played him, I actually lost to him. Oh in wow. close to ceiling. Wow. Um it was well, devastating. Oh no. <laughs> well, and it was even more devastating because he posted his win against me on Reddit and it got it was like on the front page of like the chess subreddit <laughs> <laughs> oh like my win against the international master uh something like that yeah, yeah. but it, i mean it was good publicity it just um was unfortunate that was <laughs> <first game. laughs> um, okay cool glad you know him yeah i was looking at some of his games and stuff and um yeah and he's the type of player if you play him again i mean you'll want to like look at his online account because he seems like it seems like he plays um, like the same openings online as he does in tournaments. Yeah, yeah. And that type of player, I, I love preparing against uh, where you can just like see all their online games and know exactly know. what to expect. Well, that's what I do. So I'm afraid that that will backfire on me later on. Um, that's why you should usually try and stay anonymous. <laughs> um, for me, I've I, I just play different things online than I do in tournaments, so it's usually not a problem. But if I'm like training seriously online, I'll play. I usually just play under a friend's account, or sometimes I'll create just some anonymous account. Mm. But it's uh, standard practice. Okay, cool. Um, so, anyway, um, yeah, we can go forward with the opening. One thing I'll recommend that if you get like this exact same position next time, you mm -hmm. can play Bishop B five. Ah, uh, this one you can play bishop b5. Um, it's kind of like that line I showed you in the English. Yeah. Where, like, remember, if they allow you to take and double their pawns, it just leads to a very simple position for white to play. And if bishop d7? If bishop d7, then you're still probably going to take. But then you wait for them to play a6. So you don't take immediately. Got it. You, in castle, let's say they play a6, then you take. Bishop takes. 
in d3. And this is a type of position you can have against in English where, okay, you have one less tempo if you're black, but still all the same ideas with um, queen e1, queen h4, f5. Um, mm -hmm. And usually the light, light squared bishop um, is better being traded early and if this... you're going to play grand prix than like just sit, sitting on g2 and not contributing to the attack. Mm. And you got rid of Black's Knight, which in, in many cases will come into D4, where it's a bit annoying of a piece. Interesting. So, yeah, it seems like the the Grand Prix and Close Sicilian, they're, they're like sisters. Like, they're so, really similar, but there's some nuances that are very different. Like There's some differences. Yeah. And, I, I mean, I should mention, like, putting the bishop on G2, it's, it's still very playable. It's just a different type of position where usually the attack is a bit slower. Yeah. Got it. So something to consider for uh, for next time. I'll also say Bishop C four is playable. Cool. Um, I think if you check out the games of Mikov, like that's the one player. Like if you do a search for Mikov, um, like chessgames.com, dot com, mm -hmm. and then Mikov, you should know the the eco code for Close Sicilian is B twenty three. Yeah, B twenty five. Hmm. Um, so I'll, I'll share the link in the study chat and hopefully this will be a good selection of games to, uh, to check out. Cool. Thank you. So, yeah, no problem. So anyway, let's, let's see what happens in your game. Cause you, I mean, you, you played really nicely. Like you got crushing position and then at some point things collapsed. Yeah. I, I had a nice position so, and I'm very for, unfortunate that, um, one mistake kind of held me back a little bit. Right. Um, yeah, let's go forward here. Because, I mean, overall, I like the way you played. You were very patient. He was playing some strange idea, like this 96, 94, which, in hindsight, I don't think was effective at all because he didn't play <laughs> like E4 so early. And he allowed you to play C3. And then it's already just bad for black. Yeah, um, I, I he didn't know what he was doing there. He <laughs> yeah, he admitted to me after the game, but I'm like, okay, sure. I mean, which goes to show, like, you got him out of his comfort zone, like the, uh, you, you won the opening battle. Yeah, so this is uh, ideal for the close Sicilian, kind of like this setup. Of course, yeah. Where I yeah. mean, no pieces are getting traded after C three. Mm. Um, if you play knight ed4, it's slightly better because at least like c3 and then let's say he takes on f3 or, or takes on e2. Um, now his knight is no longer on e6, so you're not get, getting tempo with f5. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's slightly better for him. It would be slightly better for him, yeah, to trade off. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I thought it would be better for me too because my queen gets to develop with tempo. And <laughs> um, I don't know if that's... Too relevant. <laughs> okay, got it. Got um, it. So black, something. yeah, feels good. It, it sounds like black wants to trade more pieces in this setup because of the attack that white wants to do. Yeah, it's weird, but like the not enough six or e six, it sometimes favors white because it's used as fuel for the attack. Like you can expand okay. while kicking it around. Yeah, and it's not necessarily a great defender. Okay, cool. Um. Now, okay, this would still be a fight. You still have your, your attack. I mean, Black could probably play b5 and focus on some kind of queenside play trying to distract you, but um, it's still preferable for white. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, if we go back and see after c3, this knight is just so sad on f8. Even though it's kind of a defender, um, okay, things kept looking to be good for you. I like knight f4, knight d5. This is all very nice. Um, you provoke f6. Uh, let's just keep going to the critical moment. There's sure. a move here, g5. I don't know if you considered this, but... Oh, I, I saw it after the game, um, mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, that would have been so good to play. Yeah, it's still a bit complicated because you're you're allowing bishop takes h3 mm -hmm. and then it's a situation where both black and white are trying to attack on the king side but i think still the the lines should favor you like you take on f6 you play rook takes f6 ready for the double up yeah it looks good um 
yeah, white is clearly her choice. But, uh, okay, you play knight e3. This is also very playable. Uh, then knight f5. I was curious, like, how much time did you have around here, like, when you played knight f5? Um, maybe about, like, 30, 40 minutes, maybe. Oh, okay, so you had a lot of time. Yeah, a good amount of time. And I should have taken more time at this point. Yeah, this is a very critical moment. I I thought I had some tactics against the H pawn. Mm. When, oh, like lifting your rook over? Yeah, and then putting my queen in. I, I thought I had something, but um, I yeah. think I, I just miscalculated. And It was a bit artificial. Yeah, yeah. Um, I this think is... maybe you also overlooked the fact that like, when you take with rook, black can get this set up with uh, the eventual e5, not f4. Yeah, I didn't see that at all. Um, which is something... Like, when you're black, you'll be kind of inclined to look for this type of active play. It's a nice kind of positional uh, creation of the outpost. But when you're white, it's, I know it's easier to overlook because mm -hmm. you're not as involved with your opponent's ideas. Yeah. So it's another moment where you just have to be aware of what your opponent wants to do. Mm -hmm. um, but going back here, I mean, in hindsight, even not in hindsight, it was just clearly better to take with the pawn. Oh, man, yeah. I, I, the knight can't establish an outpost. Yeah, I, I saw him go to knight e5, mm -hmm. and I thought maybe here, if I would have pushed d4, my pawn would be isolated, and that would mm. be bad for me. But That's the least of your worries. That's my you're, least. You're more, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> more focused on the, like clobbering the, the black king. There's no time to be worried about an isolated pawn that's <laughs> hard for the opponent to attack. Yeah. Um, huh. Actually, you, you can probably start with rook b e1 here and then, then go for d4. Mm -hmm. And the e pawn is much more of a headache. It's just completely backwards. You have full control over e6, ideas of eventual bishop e6, also lingering ideas of g5. Yeah. If huh. the knight ever tries to like go back to c6, you can also consider just taking it with the bishop and then win the e pawn. Mm hmm. So this would have been amazing for you. And like the, the idea of, of tripling up on the e-file is just so hard to stop. So you're almost guaranteed to win the e-pawn. Mm. Yeah, that would have been so good. So, so good. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is one of those like experience type things. If you show this position to like a, a strong master, they're, they're going to just intuitively take with the pawn because the, the opening of the e-file is just so valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I was trying to push something that wasn't there. Um, and that I think this moment like lost me my best advantage because now it's just pretty dead equal. Um, yeah, um, I mean, it was still playable. And actually, later on in the game, you still had chances to win. Uh, if we just go forward here. But yeah, of course, you, you let most of your advantage just slip. Um, there's one moment towards the end I just want to show you. Was sure, yes, please. Maybe painful looking back on. But I actually like the way you played. Like you got some some nice active play with your rook, and you still had winning chances. Do you remember this moment? You could play rook d1. I missed it. <laughs> uh, At this moment, we both had like under two minutes. He had like 30 seconds left, and I had two minutes. Uh, well, two minutes is a lot of time. But I know like it, it's easy to overlook even simple. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> if I this still takes I... calculation too. Oh, it, I mean, because yeah. knight d three. I mean, it's very easy calculation. You just attack the knight, and um, like there's some nice line here. King e three, bishop f one. You attack with everything. Black defends with everything, and then you trade everything, and then you just promote your pawn. Wow. Yeah, that would have been nice. Um, yeah, so like in these time scramble situations, like tactics should usually be the first priority, like the forcing moves. Mm. Um, but I can imagine, like, after even though you're up upon here, like the, the night can sometimes be trickier, especially in these time scramble situations. And it's not always about material, sometimes it's about king safety. Um, 
Yeah. Um, I'm curious how he ended up winning. He ended up winning by creating a mating net, essentially. Mm. And there's so much pressure on my king yeah. that he eventually uh, wants a material. He won this bishop because it's, uh, he had he played knight 92. e2, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, and then it was just like a 10-second scramble <laughs> from there. So uh-huh. I, w- I was close. I felt like that was – this lasted the whole four hours. And wow. um, it was one of the games where I felt like, man, like th- I could win against an expert. Um, but yeah, it was I, very close. And I think he's like – he's working very hard to become a master. Um, if you if you watch his Twitch streams, like they're all like study and trying to play high-rated players – um so it's it's a good sign that you were like on the verge of beating him a couple of times this game yeah yeah definitely um i gotta look him up more he gave me he wanted to study on the weekends and stuff but uh mm-hmm. he didn't respond to me weirdly enough um but overall like yeah this i oh, so close so close yeah Sometimes you just gotta you, you gotta message them a bunch of times. Like I know he's he's very busy, like his schedule with like Twitch or whatever. Oh, um, well, I'm mean, sorry. So close with the game, not with him. <laughs> oh, I got you. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, people say they want to do stuff, but they don't do it all the time. So I'm, I'm cool. I understand. <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh man. Anyway, we should take a look at least briefly at the the opening in the, the other game in round sixteen. Yes, yes, please. Um, Old DK of the, of the third game, right? Um, game three, the the one you had in your email. I assume that was round C four. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'll have to explain. There's a reason this isn't popular. The reason is that you can play e five here. Yeah, I, I saw it on a database, but I didn't understand. Like now we have like a stone wall structure. Uh, and... I know it looks kind of boring, symmetrical. Where like, okay, d five is weak for you, d four is weak for white. Um, there's a few purposes or a few reasons why you would play this move. Um, reason number one: if you allow white to play d four, it's already very pleasant for white. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to stop d four in this case. E five is only move that makes sense to stop d4. Um, on top of that, when you play e5, arguably this is already preferable for black, even though white has active tempo. To mm-hmm. The knight isn't exactly that well placed on f3 in this sort of structure, where a very common pawn break is f5, or in white's case, f4. So it's going to take white additional time to remove the knight and play f4. Meanwhile, you can get a more harmonious setup where you'll go for like g6, bishop g7, knight e7, castling, and eventually f5. Really? You think count the bishop here? Um, well, you wow. don't block. You don't want to block your pawn. I mean, maybe you could play bishop e7, f5, and f6. <laughs> maybe that would be another option. Yeah. I, well, I've never seen this before, so I'm just uh-huh. looking at it from fresh eyes. Like, whoa. Interesting. Um, I'm a bit curious, actually, what masters do. Um, knight C- okay, knight c6 is maybe the most flexible move. Like, you start with this because you know your knight wants to be on c6. White plays g3. Mm-hmm. Yeah, most played move here is g6. G6, yeah. Keeps the king safe. The bishop is naturally not that effective, like, wherever it goes in the structure. Especially because like your center pawns are on dark squares, mm-hmm. so when you play bishop g7, it's more about king safety. Maybe like having some influence over d4. Like if you play knight d4, yeah, support from the bishop. G6 can also support f5, or in some cases you might want to take back the pawn. Hmm. Got it. Um, yeah, it seems like it's not a ceiling anymore. <laughs> it's it's a different game here. It's a different type of opening. Um, this is. Uh, I don't know if this exact system has this name, but uh, this sort of setup with these pawns combined with like g6 and bishop g7, it's called the Bothanic system. Hmm. It's yeah. actually an opening that can be played for white. It's one of like these system-based openings where yeah. white plays in English. 
then white can play the bottleneck with this sort of move, move uh, the configuration. Mm -hmm. And usually, like d3 is played, not d4. Yeah, and that's an opening I've, I've toyed around with from the white side like when I was a bit younger. Um, it's just something like if you're lazy and you don't want to study openings and you want to play something fresh, it's it's not a bad choice for white. Yeah. But, okay. Uh, good. In this case, it's very playable for black. Mm. Got it. Nice. So, so yeah, it's good to know next time because like after knight c six d four, like it's already nice for white. Yeah, and I was like, um, I'm out of book here. Um, and then you play queen b six, which is such a rare move. <laughs> uh, I mean, you could play g six, and it would be. Uh, this is actually kind of the main line accelerated dragon. Mm -hmm. um, not the most reputable line, but very playable if, if you know what you're doing. But yeah, next time you should just avoid this. Yeah, I'll avoid this completely. Yeah, thank yeah. you for this. I appreciate it. E5, and then the close Sicilian, and then 96 ideas. You gotta um, wait until they play a6 before trading out the bishop. Uh, yeah, in that other game. Yeah. yeah. Watch out for... Uh... I, actually, let me make one one correction to that. You sure. can trade on c6 when your bishop's on b5 if they have to take back with a pawn. Oh, yes, that's true. But if their bishop's on d7, you wait for them to play a6. Hmm. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, I'm going to look up more games with this uh, Mi Mitov. What is it? Mi oh, Mikhail Mitkoff. Mitkoff. Yeah. I'll look up his games too. Yeah, there should be a good number. Um, I'm I'm browsing through here. He's, he's actually a very good number. Yeah, it's a lot of games. Okay, about forty eight games with with these eco codes. So he's played this a good amount. Well, fantastic. I'm trying cool. to think of other players between Mitkov and Gawain Jones. There's another player. Um, and sometimes this is good if you're just looking for inspiration. Yeah. Um, the other player I'm thinking of, he's probably the, the weakest out of, uh, of these three, but uh, mm -hmm. his name is Sunil Weramantri. Hmm. Have you heard of him? <laughs> I have not, no. Okay, he's Hikaru Nakamura's stepdad. Oh. Interesting relation. Oh, I, I, I know of him then. Yeah. Yeah. He's pretty well known in the chess world. He has some position with like US chess. I believe. Pretty renowned coach, too. Got it. So I'm sharing another link with his games in, uh, in Knight C3 Sicilian. Got it. The All very right. first time I ever saw Knight C3 Sicilian, I got smashed by him. <laughs> really? So devastating. I, I wish I had that game. It's on my like old, old hard drive or something, but he, mm. he completely destroyed me. So I have to, to look, look back at <laughs> Okay, I'm excited to dive in. Thank you. Yeah, for sure.